Hey there, this is MathCamp321, and in this lesson I'm going to show you how to find volumes of revolution using the DISC method. I'm going to start by giving you the formula on this slide, I'll develop that formula on the next slide, and then I'll follow with a few examples. So the formula for finding the volume of revolution using the DISC method is V equals pi times the definite integral of R squared dx from A to B where R is the radius. And you might notice embedded in this formula is yet another formula, pi r squared. And this is the formula for the area of a circle in a geometry class. So I just want you to keep this in mind. I'll explain a little bit more on the next slide why that area of a circle is so important. But this is the area of a circle, and a circle, of course, looks like a very, very flat disk. So just, I'm just trying to make that connection between a circle and a disk. Now one of the first issues students have in this section is figuring out what kind of solid they're actually trying to find the volume of. What's going to happen is you're going to be given a function and you're going to be asked to rotate that function about a line. It could be the x-axis, it could be the y-axis, it could be a random horizontal or vertical line. So in this sample problem over to the left that's highlighted in orange, it says rotate the bolded figure over the y-axis. So we have the y-axis here. And we've got this little, this little line that's got a curve to it which indicates that we're rotating around that y-axis. And the thing that we're rotating is this line. So I want you to imagine taking this line and just pivoting it around this y-axis. A certain solid is going to result and you have to anticipate what that's going to look like. So as it dips down to the right, once we spin it, it's going to dip down to the left like this. And to give it some dimension, I'm going to add some ovals. Watch this. Once you do this, you might have a better sense of what solid it is that you're looking at. And this happens to be a cone. Our next example in green is that of a semicircle. This time though, we're rotating around the x-axis. So our x-axis is over here. We indicate our rotation by putting this little arrow here. Right now we see that the semicircle is above the x-axis, but once we do the rotation, the semicircle also will appear below the x-axis. So let's try to draw that in. Okay, and to give it a little bit of depth, we're going to make these ovals, half of them solid and half of them dotted, to give the oval a little bit of depth or perspective. So I'm going to start in the center and then taper as I move to either end. Okay, so when you look at this, what at first seemed just like this semicircle on top now has turned into this sphere once we have done the rotation about the x-axis. Great, let's go on to the next slide so we can talk a little bit about why the formula gives us the volume that we're looking for. So now we're on slide number two, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why the formula that I gave you on the first slide actually works to help you find the volume of a solid of revolution. So we talked about the fact that the formula included in it the area of a circle. So let's just review on the bottom left here what that formula was. It was pi times the definite integral of r squared from a to b. And we noticed that inside of that formula was the area formula for a circle. Well, a circle is a two-dimensional figure. It's flat, it doesn't have any height, so we can't say that it has a volume. I'm gonna start by just drawing a picture of a circle in three dimensions. Now, if we take that circle and we think about what might happen if we start adding one circle on top of another circle on top of another circle, you might think of taking a collection of, let's say, 15 quarters and trying to place one on top of the other on top of a tabletop. You start off with the first quarter, which just looks like a circle, but as you start to add more and more quarters, you end up getting a solid. You end up getting a cylinder. So that's essentially what we're doing here, is we're taking one circle, and then we're stacking on top of it infinitely more circles so that you get this solid. Let's see how good this is going to look when I connect the top to the bottom, if it actually works. All right, so I kind of made the circles a little bit too small, but hopefully you get the idea. What we're essentially doing when we're integrating 
is we're stacking infinitely many circles or disks together which gives us the solid. Now the problem is that the radius is not fixed over time for anything other than a cylinder. When we look at our little example of the cylinder over here, the radius is this and the radius continues to be the same measurement each and every time. And that's not going to be the case for what we're looking at. So let's take a look at this example here. It says, think of the overall volume of the solid formed by revolving f of x over the x-axis as the sum of infinitely many disks. So the first thing I'm going to try to do is just draw that function as it is spun about the x-axis. Okay, so I first drew the, the first piece reflected, and now I'm going to start to draw my disks, but they're not going to be of uniform radius. Okay, so here's the solid. It's nothing that you would have learned in geometry. It's just sort of this very strange looking shape. But what I want you to notice is that as we move from the left of the figure over at point A, which is now kind of hard to see, this is an A here, and over here there's a B, it ends with B. The radius starts off being a certain length, but then as we move down the function or toward the right, that radius is getting longer and longer and longer, and finally at the end here, it's the longest that it's going to be. So how, do we, how are we going to deal with that since the radius is not uniform? So the formula starts out by just putting an r in the parentheses here, but that radius is really a function of whatever the function is. So it depends on what that function is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a point here. So we go over x and up y. So at this moment, the radius is y. Now I'm going to pick another point in the middle, and I'm going to call it xy. So I'm going to go over and I'm going to go up, which makes this radius y. And I'll conclude by going to this point over here. Maybe I'll introduce a third color. And I'm going to call this xy, which means I'm going to go over and up. And now this radius is y. So essentially, the radius is whatever y is. So we can think of the formula not as pi times the definite integral of r squared from a to b, but pi times y squared. And we'll take a look how this is going to play out once we look at a specific example. But what I wanted you to take away from this slide is that the, these solids are made up by adding infinitely many disks of different radii. So on slide number three, we'll take a look at our first example for which we have to find the volume of revolution. In this case, we're finding the volume of revolution about the x-axis for the given function and interval, include a sketch. So our function is y equals x squared on the interval from 0 to 2. So y equals x squared would be a parabola, and when x is 0, y is 0, and when x is 1, y is 1, and when x is 2, y is 4, and I'll try to draw that as best I can. And we're also going to bound this with y equals 0, which would be this. And we're starting when x is equal to 0, and we're going to 2. And this is the x-axis here, which is important because that's how we're going to revolve this. So I'm going to put one of these little circle thingies here to indicate that rotation. So it's basically this region right here that I'm going to be revolving about the x-axis and trying to find the volume of. So let's try to draw what this is going to look like if I were to actually do this. Okay, so hopefully my diagram gives you a little bit of a sense of what the overall shape is going to be. It looks like a cone, but it's got curved sides to it. So we want to find the volume, so I think a good place to start would be to write down the formula. Now the next thing that I'm going to do before inserting some of the other unknowns is I'm going to draw in what I feel would be the radius of this solid. And we talked in the last slide about the fact that the radius changes depending on where we are on the interval. So I'm going to draw one representative radius in red. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an arbitrary point on the function and it's going to be called xy which means that to get to that point I travel over x and up y which means that my radius is really just whatever y is on that interval 
Instead of putting r here for radius, we said that r could be y, and y happens to be x squared. Now this representative radius is perpendicular to the x-axis, and because it's perpendicular to the x-axis, we're going to look for low x and high x for our limits of integration. So our low x is 0, and our high x is 2. Now, continuing with the integration process, x squared squared is x to the fourth, and integrating this, we have pi times one-fifth x to the fifth. And because it's a definite integral, we have to remember to evaluate at zero and at two. Now, I'm gonna clean that up. There's a lot going on here, and I can write this as a single fraction. Maybe pi x to the fifth over five. Let's start by plugging in or substituting in 2. 2 to the 5th is 32, which is going to give me 32 pi over 5. And then, of course, when I substitute in 0, the result will be 0. So that's not going to contribute anything to the overall volume. So this is the overall volume of this solid. Let's take a look at another example. 